Hey, it's Jim, and this is level three of the CFA program, a constructed response set on the topic of portfolio construction. Let me just quickly remind you that we can do this essentially one of two ways. When we make the security selection decision, we can do top down in which we start with the entire economy, work our way down to the individual industries that comprise the entire economy, and then find the best stocks or fixed income securities or alternative investments inside of each industry for our particular client. Or we can do bottom up approach in which we start with the universe of stocks or bonds or alternative securities and we find the best ones for our client. And then we try to find the best ones in the best industries and then the entire, uh, and the entire economy. Notice that either top down or bottom up, we start with this entire universe and we try to squeeze it down to a portfolio that is appropriate for our client. Now, we don't ask you about top down or bottom up in this constructed response set. However, I like to emphasize it as a theme throughout the CFA program. And so you may not get top down, bottom up question on this particular uh, learning module, but, but you, you're sure to get it somewhere in the CFA level three exam. Then, of course, the next step after security selection is to uh, arrange those securities in their most optimal way. Of course, you should be thinking of Harry Markowitz uh, all the way back in 1952. And there are other ways to do this. Monte Carlo simulation is just one of them. Now, we don't ask you here in this uh, CRS about Harry Markowitz, although we do mention the word optimization in here. But I want to make sure that you combine all the stuff that you've learned so that you're prepared for all these good questions. There was my brief, uh, my brief introduction. So we'll do these, uh, these first two learning modules, overview of equity, overview of fixed income portfolio management. And so you ought to think about what's coming on that next slide is that there'll be some type of an equity portfolio and then some type of fixed income portfolio. And we'll have to figure out uh, what to do. Remember, remember, we learned this going way, way back to uh, that great economist, Thomas Sowell. I hope you guys know who, who he is. And uh, he always says things like, you know, there's scarcity of resources, but there are always trade-offs. And that's the emphasis here. What are the trade-offs inside of the equity portfolio and the fixed income portfolio? All right, let's set up this, uh, this case. So here we are, Oak Tree Capital. Uh, we have a chief investment officer. There's the word optimizes there. I told you optimization was a part of this. Uh, equity and fixed income portfolios. All right, so in equities, employ a mix of active management strategies. So we'll probably be interested in some kind of an alpha inside of there. And so there's some comments about uh, uh, the benchmark consistently underperformed the benchmark, the S&P 500. So the first question is, is that the appropriate benchmark? The S&P 500, it's appropriate for lots and lots of uh, portfolios out there, but, but maybe not ours. What we're doing is we're worried about or we're, we're thinking about shifting to a more passive approach. All right. So we've got this small cap equity fund, quantitative factor based strategy outperformed the benchmark, the Russell 2000. All right. Well, that's good news. But this uh, this outperformance has come with significantly higher volatility. All right, so this is what I was talking about with Thomas Sowell, and there are always trade-offs. All right, so we get the extra return, but then what are we doing with the extra risk? Is is it worth it? So that's why you go back to the Harry Markowitz in the Efficient Frontier, and you ask yourself the question. You know, we're trying to push up to that northwest corner. It, is it worth it? There, there's the trade-off. All right, so we're thinking about. Uh, potential benchmarks for a new equity fund in emerging markets. So there we go. So we'll probably have to pick one of the questions is going to ask us to pick one, one of those three. So what jumps out at you uh, initially? Well, the MSCI has the highest return and it has the middle correlation coefficient and it has the middle standard deviation. If you look at the uh, S&P emerging, it's got less, but it's got more. Then it's got a higher correlation. Well, I'll talk about that in just a second. But you know, you think about the the top and the bottom, the MSCI and the BMI. 
one of those is inefficient. I'll let you figure that out before we uh, before we get to the answers. All right, back to the uh, fixed income portfolio. Here's the yield curve, so it's upward sloping. And the question is, how can we use the shape of the yield curve and figure out, is there something that we can do to enhance returns? Notice up in that first part of the sentence, there's this roll down return. Ah, so we have an upward sloping yield curve, right? Now it's not much upward sloping, but it's still upward sloping. So I wanna give you a little bit of an idea about this roll down return. And for me, and the way I've always thought about this and the way I teach it to my students is that this is super kind of simple and it has some highly restrictive assumptions. In fact, you could go back to the 13 or 1400s and there were probably bond traders who were using this roll down return because it's because it's pretty simple. So let, let's see if you can follow along with me. Suppose we have a, a four year bond. And that bond has a 4% coupon rate. So let's just suppose annual payments. So, you know, think about it. You're doing, you're getting 40, 40, 40, and then 1,040. What's the price of that bond today? Well, if we have an upward sloping yield curve, and let's just suppose those spot rates are, you know, one, two, three, and four. And so you can do the math pretty quickly. And if you do that, the price of that bond today becomes, it's probably around par value. It's a little bit, it's a little bit above because we have that upward slope at a 4% coupon rate. So it might come out to be a thousand two or a thousand four dollars, whatever that is. But then, so what do you do? You buy that bond today for let's say a thousand and two dollars. And what do you get? You get the $40 and then you get the $40 and you get the $40. So after three years, assuming, is what I was saying earlier, assuming that the yield curve stays the same as it was three years ago. Well, that one year spot rate is gonna be 1%. So if you discount the $1,040 at the 1% spot rate, you get like, I don't know, $1,030 or something. So what did you do? You bought the bond at 1,002 and you sold it at 1,030. So that's the, that's the roll down return. And that works under those sets of limiting uh, uh, assumptions that yield curve is upward sloping, it's going to stay upward sloping, stability. That's why the Institute emphasizes in this section of the learning module, that they use the word stability. And in, in fact, I think in one sentence, it uses the word stability 10 times, assuming stability and the stable and stability and stable. Is there another form of stability? How about uh, stabilicious? I have no idea what, where I just came up with that. <laughs> All right. And then lastly, uh, we've got uh, three people who make a comment. You guys know this. I say this almost every recording. The Institute loves to ask you whether you agree or disagree. In this case, we're going to have to choose between John and Emma and Michael who say something like one says, hey, counterparty risk is the the biggest of the three. One says interest rate risk and one says basis risk. So we'll probably have to uh, answer that question. So let's go ahead and look at the four questions. Ah, so two rationales for Oak Tree to maintain active management despite the higher volatility. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the trade-off. Question two, which of the three indices are we gonna have to pick? I already mentioned that earlier. Uh, how the shape of the yield curve, there we go. And then which are the, those three? So that, uh, that makes perfect sense. All right, you ready for this one? Let's start with question one. So what did we decide back there? Uh, this is all about trade-offs. What we also have to do is be aware of the knowledge that in the small cap space, there's probably higher standard deviations for a number of reasons not least of which is size, but maybe just as important or perhaps even more important is that not a lot of analysts are following these small cap firms, which means that there's probably private information in there that's more substantial than it is for a company like Hershey Foods or Procter & Gamble. So there might be, you know, I, I'm, I, I was taught by people who loved uh, Harry Markowitz and Eugene Fama when I was in graduate school. So uh, I always have to say this with, uh, you know, something in my cheek like a squirrel. Yeah, there are, there are some inefficiencies out there and I'm perfectly willing to admit that. And the Institute uh, emphasizes those inefficiencies, so less coverage. Um, so what, look at that second bullet point. Ah, fertile ground. I would have never come up with fertile ground uh, in the stress of an exam, uh, but that's a great word to use. Um, so active management, I would have said something like, well, you know what? 
we can go in there and if we perform our due diligence, we're probably going to find undervalued stocks in there. So then the ultimate is, and I would have used the Thomas Sowell trade-off. I would have said, hey, absolutely. The fact that I'm, uh, I'm a hard worker, you know, I'm pretty smart. I can go, I can find these things and that's going to warrant the increase in volatility. And uh, at the end of the investment horizon, everyone's going to be happy with, uh, with my decision for trade-off. Now, the second part of this is that there is uh, uh, active management allows for greater flexibility, which means that as I'm performing my due diligence and I'm dumping into the small cap space, what I can do is I can also look around, right? So I'm in the small cap space, so I'm doing bottom up here. Ah, I got you on that one. So I'm doing the bottom up and then I'm looking at the industry and then looking at the economy and I'm saying something like, oh my heavens out there, we have a new presidential election. Looks like this person is gonna win. Therefore, that's gonna mean this for taxes, this for employment, this for, this for, this for. So greater flexibility. Now back to that uh, back to that table with these three possibilities. I think I gave away the answer as we were uh, as we were going through that table. Um, so we're going to pick that first one, right? The uh, MSCI. Uh, how are we justifying this? So three-year annualized return. It is the highest among the three. Standard deviation is just a little bit higher those, but there's a good balance, see good balance, there's the trade-off, always listen to, uh, always listen to Thomas Sowell. And then over on that last column, and remember I said, I'll mention something about correlation coefficient later. Well, now, now is that time to be later. So here's my idea of, of the perfect benchmark, and let's just take a simple one. Suppose I've got 10 stocks in my portfolio and they're in 10 different industries. They all have different betas. They all have different standard deviations. They all have different, you know, all those different characteristics. So what's my perfect benchmark over here? My perfect benchmark would be 10 different stocks that operate in those same 10 industries, but they're completely different stocks. Maybe some are leaders, maybe some are followers, maybe have big size, maybe have little size, but so the idea then would be that the benchmark would have Boy, I'm not going to say this. Don't tell your finance professors I said this. Nearly perfect correlation coefficient between the two. Now, that's virtually impossible, but we like to have the benchmark to look like, from a statistical standpoint, to look like the original portfolio. But we know that that's, that's probably not possible. You know, the other, the other choice is, and notice that those correlation coefficients, what were they? 65, 60, and 70, so they're probably okay. So this is, you know, the difference between, uh, the difference among those three is probably not that uh, dramatic. Notice in our justification, we say moderate correlation, striking a balance, there's the trade-off thing again. But I'm guessing that what the Institute might do on the exam is give you one that looks really, really good. So it's got, you know, high return and it's got low standard deviation. Over here, the correlation coefficient is like 0.11. You don't want to have a 0.11 correlation coefficient with, uh, with, your, uh, with your constructed portfolio. Yeah, I think my example earlier gave you a hint about what this uh, yield curve presentation information effects is going to look like. Okay, so upward sloping, we said that. Uh, p positive potential for the roll down return. So what did I say in my example? You bought for a thousand and two or three dollars, you sold it for a thousand and twenty eight or thirty dollars, whatever that is. Um, and that's because, so here's our upward sloping yield curve, that's because we're rolling down. Actually, I mean, we're rolling down on the upward sloping, but we're rolling backwards to a one-year maturity. So the idea is you buy a four-year bond and you sell it after three years, or you buy a 30-year bond and you sell it after 15 years, or, 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 whatever that is. Of course, the major concern here is shift in the yield curve. Now let's go and answer this. I think this is the most interesting of, of the four questions. So let me let me go back here and see what these uh, what these people said exactly. So I get it right. All right, let's start with the bottom up. So the biggest risk is basis risk. So we're going to do this total return swap. So let's just take a simple total return swap. So what's happening? We've got this. We have a fixed income portfolio. Let's suppose that all of our bonds in there are. Um, 
fixed rate bonds. So, so we're receiving we're receiving the the fixed rate. So what we want to do is enter the swap. We want to throw the fixed weight rate over to the swap dealer. We receive fixed payments from the portfolio, so we get rid of them and uh, send those fixed payments over to the swap dealer. In return, the swap dealer is going to send us a floating return, and this will be a total return on, it could be an individual bond, it could be a basket of bonds, it could be a portfolio of bonds, it could be an index of bonds, whatever that is. So what we wanna do is that we want to manage that basis risk. I mean, think about it. So Michael would be right if we're sending this fixed rate and we're receiving the total return on the return on artwork that was painted in the 1400s. Well, those two things don't look anything alike. So there's gonna be tremendous basis risk. But if we select the total return, the total return on a portfolio that looks a little bit like ours, maybe it has a high correlation. So we can manage that basis risk. So Michael is right, but there are ways to manage. There are ways to manage that basis risk so that we shouldn't have too many unexpected losses. Ah, so the key in saying that Michael's not correct is that we can manage that kind of risk. Well, how about interest rate risk? Well, this is the same thing that what we're doing is, of course, what do we want? We want interest rate. We're paying the fixed, right? So what do we want? We want total return. So if interest rates go up, then we probably win. But what's going to happen is that if we are careful in our selection of that underlying swap portfolio, then that interest rate risk could be managed. All right. So so Emma is right as well. Interest rate risk could demolish the portfolio. However, counterparty risk, remember this is a total return swap. So we're in, we're in the over the counter market, which means that uh, I could be the counterparty, right? Just Jim, just regular old Jim college professor sitting in his living room. And I could say, sure, you want a $1 trillion swap, I'm all in. Well, there's no possible way that I could sell my favorite financial calculator and use that as collateral. And by the way, um, in this section, it's just a small section in this learning module. The uh, Institute is very big on mentioning that collateral is used uh, for these kinds of transactions, which minimizes the counterparty risk. But there's no sense in here of counterparty uh, risk and collateral being used in this one. So if you're trading with me and I don't show up, Think about a trillion dollars. Uh, the total return is, you know, say it's just this much, say a trillion times this much. I owe you $50 billion. There's no way that I'm going to pay that. So counterparty risk is the dominant risk of these three. What kind of a standard answer are we going to give here? Yeah, counterparty risk is the most significant. So potential for total loss if the counterparty defaults, right? If that's me, entire value of the swap. But then, but then if there's a counterparty over there that defaults and then a counterparty over there that defaults, well, that might lead to counterparty. You know, we used to call that uh, contagion back in, uh, back in the old days. Uh, I think the cool word today is systemic risk. There it is in uh, in part two. Uh, has some other uh, uh, terms out there. So that takes us through uh, this constructed response set. This is fun for me. Hope you guys learned something here today. So thanks for watching and good luck studying.